Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Sacedo's YouTube videos. Today, we're going to be talking about Le Chatelier's principle. So Le Chatelier's principle is kind of a little trick, if you want to think about it that way, that helps you understand what happens to a reaction when it's in equilibrium and you decide to change that somehow. So all you got to know is every reaction is trying to reach equilibrium. Okay, no matter what's happening, every reaction on Earth is always going to be trying to reach an equilibrium. But what happens when you know you decide to do something to that system and it's already in balance? What are you supposed to you know kind of predict is going to happen, right? So Lashatsky's principle says: if you apply a stress to a system in equilibrium, the system will shift in a way to relieve the stress, right? So, like I said, chemical reactions, just like us, want to be nice and relaxed. They don't want to be stressed out. And so since they don't want to be stressed out, there has to be, you know, something has to give if you're trying to upset um, a system that's already in equilibrium. So what are the most common kinds of stress, you know, that um, chemicals go through in chemical reactions? The first is if you change their concentration, if you add more of something or you take away something. Another thing that could happen, you change the temperature, you heat it up or you cool it down. Or you change the pressure, okay? You add more pressure or you take pressure away. All of those things can change and shift equilibrium in a chemical reaction. Now, what happens when you change concentration? So if you change concentration, uh, let's say you add something. If you add something, the reaction will try to lower the amount of substance you added, right? Because think about it, it was in balance and you added something. So it's gonna say, okay, I wanna get rid of that thing. On the other hand, what if you get rid of something, you remove it, then the system's gonna think, okay, wait, I need to make more of that because you took it away. And again, remember, this is systems that are already in equilibrium and you are trying to shift that somehow by changing it. So why does that happen? So I like to think of it as a, a seesaw and R stands for reactants, P stands for products. What happens if we increase the amount of reactants to the seesaw? Boom, this is what happens. Which direction will the chemical reaction need to move in order to restore equilibrium? So picture this, which direction left or right is this going to need to move in order to be balanced again? It's going to have to move to the right, right? We're going to need to make more of these in order to balance that. What about the opposite? I increase the products. What's going to happen? Think about it again, right? I'm going to need to make more of this in order to balance that, and so it would move to the left. Next up, what if I remove it? If I remove reactants, what's going to happen? I'm going to need to make, I'm going to need to shift it which direction? I'm going to need to shift it this way to the left in order to balance it back out. And if I decrease products, what's going to happen? Well, obviously, I'm going to need to make more of this, so I'm going to have to shift it to the right in order to make more of what you took away. So how is that going to look? It's going to look like this. And it's also important to realize only gases and aqueous solutions matter. Remember, in equilibrium expressions, solids and liquids don't mean a thing to us. So which direction is the equilibrium going to shift if I add more nitrogen gas? If I add more of this, which direction is it going to go? Answer, it's going to move to the right. It's going to get rid of this stuff. It's going to say, okay, hey, you added more of this. I need to make more of this to balance it out. What if I remove this? It's going to go to the left, right? It's going to say, hey, you took this away. I want more of this. What if I add more of this? It's going to go to the right. It's going to say, hey, you added more of this. I need to balance this out by making more of that. What if I remove it? Same thing, right? It's going to say, hey, you took this away. I need more of this. What if you add more product? It's going to say, hey, I already had enough. I'm going to need to make more of this then in order to balance it out. And what if you remove product? It's going to go to the right then, right? It's going to say, hey, you took this away. I need to make more of this. That is how Le Chatelier's principle works. Try this one for size. What if I add more carbon? Answer, nothing happens. It's a solid. And yes, I was trying to trick you. What if I remove this? Nothing happens. It's a solid. Again, trying to trick you. What if I add more of this? It's going to go to the left, right? It's going to say, hey, I need more of this then. What if I remove CO? It's going to go to the right, right? It's going to say, hey, wait a second. I need to make more of this stuff. All right. What if I change the temperature? So remember, temperature and K are linked. So if you change the temperature, K is going to change. So that means that temperature is affected directly with the <laughs> temperatures affected. K is affected by temperature. So that's where it becomes very important to know whether or not we have a system that is absorbing or releasing heat. And so in case you forgot, endothermic means energy is being absorbed. 
exothermic means that energy is being released. We like to represent that by delta H. And so if you see delta H and it's a positive number, that means it's endothermic. If you see delta H and it's a negative number, that means that it's exothermic. Positive absorbing, negative releasing. Why? Okay, now let's see what happens here. So in an exothermic reaction, heat is a product, remember? So you're making heat. So what happens if you add heat to an exothermic reaction? You actually make it go the opposite direction. If you add heat to something that's already hot like that, it's going to say, hey, no, I'm going to go the opposite direction. I need to cool myself off. I already have enough heat. What if you remove heat? It's going to say, hey, I need to make more of this heat. I need to heat myself back up again. And in fact, that's why we like to put exothermic reactions in ice. If you do them in ice, it's going to say, hey, okay, I need to keep making more heat, keep making more heat. And you push the reaction to the product side. What about endothermic? If you add heat, it's going to say, oh, thank you so much. I need to absorb more heat. And so it's going to make more product. That's why we like to heat up endothermic things like that in order to make the reaction go to completion. On the other hand, what if you remove heat? That's horrible, right? It takes heat to start endothermic reactions like this. So, hey, you're going to need to actually go, you're going to go backwards if that happened. Let's try this. All right. So I got a negative value. That means heat is my product here. What happens if I increase the temperature of an exothermic reaction? goes to the left. What if I decrease the temperature? goes to the right. Hey, I should, right? If I want to make products, then I should definitely decrease the temperature of an exothermic reaction. What about this? So I've got a positive value that's endothermic, and so that means that heat is on the reactant side. What if I increase the temperature? Oh, good. It's going to make more product. What if I decrease the temperature? Ah, uh, don't want that. It's going to end up making more reactants, right? So that's it. We don't have really time to go over the pressure one, but um, it's kind of intuitive also. But um, if you have any questions,